Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast as I readjust my camera. Uh, today with me we have an avid outdoor adventurer, uh, big time herper, uh, Colorado local I believe, uh, Ian Breland. How are you doing Ian? Doing good man, thanks for having me on. This is cool. awesome. I think we got a little bit of a delay but it'll be okay I think. Let's see. A little bit. Let me, uh, yeah. here, I'll try without delay because I'm, I'm okay. on Bluetooth. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that's probably better because I don't have any delay on my Okay, end. cool. Yeah. Sweet. And you can hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Sweet. Perfect. So, um, like, I, like I said, I'm pretty sure you're a Colorado local, right? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. For the oh. last 10 years. So. Sweet. So. <laughs> yeah. And then. Um, so, and you're obviously like, that's kind of your big thing on social media is you are, you're from Colorado, but you're out herping and you're going out and seeing, you know, the animals that we all love out in nature. So, I mean, kind of how'd you, as I still adjust mine, um, how'd you get your start? Uh, well, honestly, like so many other herpers and just people that love animals, I had a lot of great experiences with them as kids. Uh, my parents were super welcoming towards it. At least my mom was. She would nice. always help me go find garter snakes, go remove them from our neighbor's yard. And then there was one garter snake I remember I got that was attacked by a cat. And uh, we kept it in a bucket and tried to like rehab it. And I was probably like, I was probably like five years old back then. Wow. And uh, I tried, I was so, I was just a little kid. I like tried to feed it a hot pocket. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I named him Slinky. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know that they drank water. <laughs> no, they're like amphibians, but I had such a good time. I just like loved them after that, from that moment on. I don't even, I don't even have any other passions that I loved anywhere close to that since then. So that's awesome. It just went uphill. I ended up, uh, I went to an expeditionary school too, uh, called Rocky Mountain School of Expeditionary Learning. Once I moved mm -hmm. down to Colorado, which was 2010. And they really harbored it because they were like taking us on expeditions and field trips almost monthly. So awesome. I would go find snakes. I wasn't really allowed to catch them, but uh, cause you know, the teachers were not trusting that a kid in middle school was gonna be able to ID a bull snake. But right. it was so fun, dude. And I mean, I'm trying to expand my horizons nowadays, like especially this coming year, that's actually one of my big goals is to not just enjoy snakes, but the amphibians, the other reptiles, I need to learn my lizards so much more than I know, especially internationally. Right. But uh, yeah, it was, it was like a lot of other people's story. <laughs> yep, that's, that's, that is kind of like the big common one. I'm actually one of the weird ones who didn't get into it, like from, from a young age, I had a really big gap. But yeah, just, you know, catching garter snakes, catching frogs and stuff. That's how everybody kind of gets their start in this. So when did you, when did you really start going out like, seriously herping i know going out on field trips and 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 doing stuff with school is that kind of how it started to really get going and you started to just do it on like your own time yeah yeah i remember the day i got a car is when it really started to kick <laughs> in the gear i was like i was probably like uh 16 i think i got it as soon as i could and right uh, sorry there's a bunch of cars floating around me uh Wonderful. and I went out, I was going then to Southeast Colorado, which is kind of like the Kansas of Colorado, um, Otero right. County. That's, we have probably close to 30 species of snakes down there, tons of herpetofauna. Uh, and I was doing like weekend trips any second that I could, spending all right. the money I possibly had with my little weekend or week uh, lifeguard job. And that's when I started to take big species off the list. I would go on big road trips down to Arizona uh, for monsoon season. I still do that every year with some buds and we really we, we just learned through trial and error it was like kind of I feel like we were kind of one of the last waves of herpers that didn't have much of the internet to use like I didn't really have Instagram back then or anything right we just go out and uh we just see what we found we if we didn't know what it was we'd have our little like $30 Peterson field guides and oh dude everyone awesome. loves those yeah yeah man those are sweet That's so cool so yeah it was, so it was fun so you so you started out in Colorado, then you slowly branched out. Um, have you gotten really all of Colorado species? Uh, of Colorado, 
Let's see. I have a uh, California king snake left, which is insane okay. that it's here. Uh, no. They live in the the Four Corners region. You probably know about mm-hmm. that. They're like some of the most beautiful uh, high white Cali kings that are out there. Only probably yeah. single digits of them have ever been found in the state. So I still have that. Uh, there's a Tantilla species, a black-headed species on the west slope I haven't gotten. I haven't seen a midget-faded rattlesnake in the state. I've seen them in Utah. Yeah. Um, what else? Blind snakes are like the holy grail of the state, actually. Like Cali Kings, no one even really knows are here, so they're not really the holy grail. You really only know mm-hmm. it if you're hardcore. <laughs> but yeah. uh, the, the blind snakes, everyone knows that blind snakes in Colorado are like, and, and speckled kings, which I've seen a couple of those. They're not nearly as hard as blind snakes. I think the last time a live blind snake was recorded in Colorado was like 2010. And oh, it wow. crawled up to these researchers. Yeah, in this, and I stayed at this exact campsite looking around, flipping rocks. It was like a rainy day and I flipped all through the night in midsummer. I should have seen something, but um, oh, nothing but ring necks. And these researchers that were down there in 2010, one hadn't been seen. They were actually declared, I think they were like locally extinct in Colorado for a long time. And then one crawled up and into the while they were all around their fire and they had been looking for them this whole their whole trip the researchers were targeting blind snakes and they hadn't seen anything and one crawled right up to their fire and like right between some dude's legs he was like oh that's, look at that that's so crazy man yeah like I, so those yeah they're insane dude and you, there's no predicting them uh one guy actually the most recent one was in 2010 i just remembered uh, i was my friend uh was it brendan no it was do you know hunter johnson Colorado snake hunters yep I, I, we've never we've never interacted but yeah I know Hunter yeah he does a lot of good conservation work he really is good at recording all of his finds and stuff and awesome. keeping him on the DL which so I didn't even know that this happened but uh him and his friend <laughs> flipped a blind snake or maybe it was just his friend uh down in a completely new county for him I believe oh, wow. uh last summer so and it was totally live and then uh Rob Smet Logic he found one back in t- like 2008 maybe uh okay of a dor on higby road oh wow yeah. really which yeah i don't know if you know that it's it's a mm-hmm. super uh common spot that's why i'm fine giving out the name everyone pretty much knows that road there's yeah, not much else that, to see on it besides coach whips and water snakes but yeah actually i don't see too many coach whips um in colorado in general although this last year was pretty dry for me herping um but I'm glad you brought that up. So when a lot of people decide to really start, you know, herping and going out there to try to find these species, you know, a lot of people are really reluctant to give out specific locations. Do you want to kind of explain why that is for people who don't quite get it? Yeah. Um, you know, it used to honestly not even be that way, like before I was even into herping. Uh, I'm sure as you know, like people, it wasn't even called herping, it was snake hunting and people yep. shared their spots. They took out new friends to new spots. They'd all, they couldn't really network over social media, but I mean, there was not much hiding of spots, especially in Colorado. And uh, it, there was, there were, a, there was a whole wave of different reasons, I think, that led to the climate that we have right now and the herping community of not sharing spots. Uh which you could attack from multiple angles, but I would say the the most driving factors of people being so secretive and sometimes even even coming off as rude, even when they don't mean to be, is that uh, spots, when you take someone, so for example, when you take someone to a flip site anywhere in the country, any, anywhere in the world, you know, they're all similar, um, where you go flip for AC, artificial cover, um, yep. then that could be great and you trust them and that that they're not gonna do anything stupid take any snakes hurt any snakes but the problem comes when they get into herping or they make new friends and now they want to show their friends and a cool snake as well just like you did and they take their friends to this spot and then those friends take their friends and it's just a domino effect and before you know it uh the microhabitat under all these places are just destroyed like a lot of ac spots should only be hit a couple times a year in my opinion uh, maybe a peak season like once or twice and because there's so much going on that we can't see with our eyes or so many people just don't know uh, in that tiny little micro environment just from the the humidity uh, that has to stay sealed under there in certain places to the snakes that are super sensitive uh, to 
being stressed out and it ends up kind of resulting in a big I don't, I don't know it, it's it's very messy subject but it, 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 it can definitely it can decimate areas essentially uh really mm -hmm. quickly without anyone having any kind of uh malice malicious intent it can just yep. happen but then on the other side there is the malicious intent which is definitely out there uh to poach animals and that's happened in colorado at one of our most our most well known now uh board lines out in eastern colorado for hog noses and milk snakes uh yep. i know rob kreutzer and his son had a really bad experience out there uh I mean, there was there was the very first albino hog, western hognose snake that was brought into the industry. You probably know that because you breed snakes um, out in Colorado, yeah. and it was beautiful. It was the first one ever found wild caught, and uh, the guy ended up taking it, breeding it. And then people went back out there looking for him, and then I mean, there's amazing genetics out in eastern Colorado for western hogs, so it just got flooded. And now there's trailer parks out there and all like people in trailer parks love herping because there's nothing else to do out there. They'll go out there and ruin sites and face all they have to do is log on to Facebook and see a landmark that looks somewhat similar. And cause there's only so many roads out there and highways that lead into good habitat. I mean, you could, a, a child could find a spot out there that's pretty well known and just take all the snakes from it. And they're not, yep. they don't replenish themselves, you know, like those, those sensitive species like hog noses that, have reproductive biology that we just don't fully understand and uh, milk snakes especially like no one knows you know the, t the population that lives under the ground it could be super high and this could be not a bad issue or we could be completely decimating their an entire part of their uh, generation so it's true yeah that's so that's that's what leads to that which is what I think I'm, ho I'm, I'm hoping that more people are starting to understand that, you know, it, it's that kind of looter mentality exists now because of, you know, the kind of the reptile pet industry. And so that's everyone's out there looking for like the next new different thing, which, as mm -hmm. you said, either malicious or not can lead to habitat loss and destruction. And it can offset an entire population of, you know, breeding for a year or even more. Um, mm -hmm. but, exactly. but that being said, we'll kind of move on from the kind of negative parts of that. So what's it, what's it kind of like going out herping as often as you do? Uh, well, you know, from social media, it looks like I'm just spending all day, every day out there herping, but in reality, yep. you know, Colorado is like super bipolar with weather and climate. So especially this year, I think across the entire world, basically, uh, herping was not great for many places just because of lack of rainfall or too much rainfall or swings in temperatures. So it's really great when I can get out there, uh, which I, I do as much as I can. It's pretty much every weekend, but I work a nine to five job with doing videography, which sometimes allows me to film because or to, to go out and herp while I film. Uh, but for the most part, I'm just going out there for two or three hour rocket runs or sometimes a weekend trip. And um, I juice it for sure. I get as much out of it as I can. And I'll usually right. map, map out the whole thing, uh, hit my targets, but I also try to stay really open to trying new places and going to do new things. Like even if it's not herp related on a herp trip, just seeing the scenery and like actually appreciating what I'm getting out there besides the snakes, because then it's a win-win if you don't see anything you at least exactly, get yeah. to be out there experiencing nature. So, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm pretty blessed to be able to go out as much as I do, especially internationally. Uh, my, my kind of trick for that is uh, I film a lot for nonprofits abroad. So mm -hmm. like uh, Oja Nueva, if you've ever heard of them, uh, they're, yeah. they're great Amazon based in uh, Madre de Dios region of Peru. They, they do a lot of crazy good work with rehabbing animals they, um, and reintroducing animals, more importantly, uh, into the wild. Uh, they did that for the first time ever with an ocelot. Uh, oh, wow. They, they did it once. They tried once with an ocelot, and there's just a crazy tragedy that happened to that one uh, out of their control. And then they ended up, by some crazy stroke of luck, uh, getting another ocelot that had been kept as a pet by loggers. And uh, they successfully reintroduced that one. 
and now he's out in the wild, no human contact. He can hunt on his own. Uh, awesome. It was great. They, they were, they're nowhere close to the places that you see a lot in the States or uh, advertised for tourism where people can go see the animals. I could, I went there and filmed for them for two weeks and I never laid eyes on the ocelot because he was deep in the jungle in a rehab center. No one can see him, but the one person that's doing it. And uh, so I, I'll go out there though and film for them. And then when I'm not filming, I just go herping uh, and I can then herp the Amazon at night and go that's do, awesome. you know, night walks all night and then film for these great people in the daytime. So that's my next plan. Actually, uh, we're going down in uh, January on the 20th, just for oh, a wow. couple of weeks. That's going right go, up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go um, try to get some snakes, bring back a dog because she, my, the, the owner of that uh, nonprofit, Sam, she also takes care of a lot of dogs. She has such a big heart. It's insane. So she has 11 dogs right now. There's a lot of feral dogs down there. She'll take yeah. pretty much every single one that she can possibly afford to feed and care for. So I'm going to bring one back uh, for a friend and then I think one back for myself. But yeah, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the international thing. Um, so when you go down, how, how many times have you been down there to that specific I've one? Down, I've been down three times now. So okay. uh, to Peru, that's by far my favorite place uh, to go. But I'm also not, I'm not like a super seasoned world traveler, you know, I'm only 22 right. years old. So That's I really want to go try and, yeah, I really want to go try new places like Asia is big on the list. Uh, Bolivia, right. Brazil, the uh, Mato Grosso kind of area, uh, yeah. or the Pantanal too. Oh, uh, but, Pantanal would be cool. Yeah, dude, like for yellow anacondas, that would be amazing. But I just cannot stay away from like, now that I've been to Peru, to uh, Southeast Peru and Northeast Peru. I'm just like so blown away. I have to go back as soon as I can. And then I end up spending all of my yearly travel budget on doing that. <laughs> but it's like totally worth it. And then when I got my first anaconda down there last time, I was, that was even more fueled with fire. And I now I just want to go back and find bigger and bigger anacondas. It's That's like awesome. a drug, dude. That's crazy. I was, I was going to ask like, what's, do you have, like, do you, do you target different species when you're down there? What's your, you know, what's your, like, what, what, what's your, your, your Everest down there in these specific places? But I think you pretty much just laid it out there. Yeah. Um, well, honestly, of course, the target for most people in the Amazon is a big anaconda. Uh, right. but those are so elusive when you're not in the Pantanal. You know, when you're when you're over there in the wetlands of Brazil or some parts of Peru in their range, then it's decently easy. You can almost road cruise uh, kind of like the Everglades around like these big wetlands areas. You can see them crossing the road or you can just wade through the wetlands and you can find them with your feet. A lot of people do that or sticks. Uh, they'll just yeah. poke things and if it, they feel their like legs moving out from under them, there's a huge anaconda under there. <laughs> but and where I was like, you can, really can't do that because there's just huge, massive uh, super powerful rivers flowing and yeah. there's huge anacondas in there, but you could never get to them, never find them. So the one place that I went, uh, to really put in like hours and hours every day for an anaconda was, uh, the floating forest. Have you heard of that? I know a little bit about it. Like I've heard it like mentioned off and on, but I don't know too, too much. So the floating forest is a part of, uh, the Tambopata area which is it's a little if I'm remembering geography right uh it's a little northwest of Madre de Dios uh and there's a lot more animals it's a lot more dense it's also a lot more touristy because it's pretty close it's kind of like the first spot that you can go to when you land in the Amazon from Puerto Maldonado mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people do river cruisings there and stuff but we went uh to a little village out there not touristy at all we went really deep in a few mm -hmm. hours in, into the Tampapada. We weren't actually on the reserve. We were kind of a little outside of it on private property. Uh, a few people had said of the local villagers, they had said that they had seen anacondas over the years when it flooded, uh, crossing mm -hmm. through their yards and stuff. So we we're like, great. hey, let's go try here. And uh, so I wasn't the first person though to, to go to the floating forest. Um, it was Paul Rosalie, I think, yeah. and him, and, uh, JJ, who's, a big he's a big influence on me and I think pretty much anyone that knows him uh he was probably one of the first people 
to discover the floating forest uh, other than the villagers that knew about it. But it's basically right. a big conglomerate of palms, some kind of special super aquatic palm uh, that can mm-hmm. grow on the water essentially so the roots all flow down into water and it's black water it's like deep black water like 30 40 feet and uh you can't see there's big black caimans in there which are like the size of american alligators they're huge yeah so those you know can actually take people down and so it's it's pretty nerve-wracking walking through there you just walk on little palms and but you can you can just fall right through the ground so it's basically you go through the forest you're going through like terra firma uh flat stuff but it's all very dry and then you walk down into this kind of bowl you have to take a little tuk tuk to get in there a little jungle off-road tuk tuk for about an hour uh through and you gotta like cut logs and stuff to get the tuk tuk through because it all grows back so fast and no one else really goes back there and uh it's all in paul Paul rosalie's book he describes it a lot better because he spent a lot more time there i only was there for like three or four days but uh, we basically would go drive down, you walk down into this kind of bowl area, it looks just green and jungly, but then you realize that it's all water based, basically, that instead of soil, it's just water. So it begins like knee height, and then you keep walking and it becomes like chest height, and then it's deeper than chest. So you gotta like, you gotta like find these little islands of palms, and just swim slash crawl onto them and like pull yourself up, you can barely even hurt. There's actually a, a super special uh, fertilance subspecies that lives there. Uh, oh. it's, it's some kind of lance head. It's like Bothrops. Um, shit, I, I don't want to butcher it, but uh, it's a oh, really yeah. pretty one. It's like goldenish, it's super light colored, but we can't even look for it and or really even keep an eye out for it because we're just, or an anaconda, because we're just trying to survive, like crawling through the palms. And there's a right. bunch of uh, nocturnal hornets. And if you knock any of the palms with your machete, if you cut off the wrong one and there's a nocturnal hornet uh, nest under it, then they'll light you up real quick. And there's a <laughs> bunch of them that are stinging you the whole time. So we actually didn't couldn't locate an anaconda, but that is the place where you would go if you could find There, we didn't locate one. Um, but that's where you would go if you wanted to find a monster, like a huge anaconda, like record-breaking. Um, Paul Rosali, he's seen one that he i'm pretty sure believes was in the 20s uh for a that's wise. a monster yeah and they lost it uh he made a whole illustration of his like epic encounter with it it was just sunning on the bank and we did see slides from them sunning you can just see like they literally use the tributaries as highways in this yep. system so the huge huge females will just carve out like the landscape it's insane so but you'll never find them unless they're out sunning uh because the water's so deep and it's so black you could put your hand in the water and you wouldn't be able to see like a foot in front of you so you can't look like go snorkeling down there and look for them you couldn't go diving and they're all down there uh no one really knows the population but there's probably i i would say it was some of the biggest am- the biggest anacondas in the world are in that area it's just so perfect for them that's so. crazy yeah, that's I love it. absolutely nuts. So do you think, um, I'm trying to actually figure out a better way to phrase this. So when you're not, when you're not looking for, you know, the anacondas, when you're out doing night walks, um, like, are you doing, are you looking for like eye shining, like some of the, like some of the arboreal guys or what do you, what uh, do you like, how, how do you go about that? You know, I've, for whatever reason, I don't know if I have kind of bad eyesight or what, but, or just night vision, but I really don't see very good eye shine unless I'm looking for caiman. I'm kind of like, I don't know. I'm I'm like amazing at finding caiman or crocodile eye shine. I just can see it. I can point it out from a moth or a a bug or a bird or a frog. It's, it shines really bright to me, but for snakes, I've never found a snake with eye shine and I've been with people and they found snakes with eye shine right next to me, like 30, 40 meters off the trail, deep through brush. And they see like a northern wow. cat eyed snake, like crawling on the ground. Shout out to Holly O'Donnell for doing that. If you know who she is, <laughs> she, she's a god, a goddess at finding frogs and snakes with uh, head headlights. She she will literally see their eye shine. She found a Pac Man frog one night. Oh a my big gosh. One. Like, yeah, like big. And it was, it was dark colored, it wasn't one of the vibrant ones. Uh, right. buried in the soil and she spotted it like 50 feet off the trail she's like I think I see a snake and she ran off and then she comes out with like this big lumpy frog it was insane and I was like okay so you can you can actually find them with 
eye shine. And then she found a snake, this cat eyed snake with eye shine. And she found a bunch of tree frogs with eye shine, uh, monkey frogs. And um, yeah, she's great. I think, I think everyone just kind of develops naturally their own tactic for finding snakes in yeah. the jungle. Cause it's just so different from her being anywhere else, like in the world, that kind of habitat. And you really have to work for every single snake. I mean, we yeah. were, I would be out all night hiking, probably like six miles total, um, like looking for anything. And I would probably come up with one or two snakes a night. You can pretty much guarantee a snake if you put in the work, you're never going to get skunked, but uh, you have to really put it in. And so even if you know I shine. So I, my kind of tactic is uh, looking for patterns and shapes that break up the normal foliage like right. most people would uh but you really can't see color too well you don't and you don't want to flood the light through because you won't be able to see anything so i use actually a pretty weak uh headlamp and i just look for shapes that are off which is still tough in the amazon because you have vines and crazy plants like you've never seen uh yep. that make weird shapes that are literally perfect for snakes like there's this one that is it literally like you could walk right up to it and put your face next to it still remember it it's a vine that looks just like a green or a emerald tree boa Oh, wow. And it's not an emerald tree bow, it's just a vine, but uh, it definitely helps to be able to have a species in mind or a shape in mind and just try to uh, manifest it and it'll show up eventually. Have you ever actually, have you found an emerald tree bow? I haven't. Uh, I no. found, so when I was, I was in the Amazon when my friend Sean was in, uh, where was he? He wasn't in Colombia or Trinidad. What's the country in South America where um, they speak French? Oh, uh, um, uh, Guyana? Guyana, I think it was Guyana. Yeah, yeah, he was there. And uh, way more snake density there. I mean, it's like yeah. basically where I go in the Amazon, but turn up the volume on the amounts of snakes that you can find. Like they were guaranteed for the lance every night. Uh, Amazon oh. tree bows almost every night. Those are really common, and I've only seen a couple of those down in Peru, but uh, he he did manage to find a, a green tree boa uh, laying. It was, it was coiled in ambush right above the ground because when they get big enough, they'll come down from the canopy and hunt for actual rodents and things that live on the ground so they can take those down, or they'll wait for the bats and birds to fly by with their crazy teeth and just nail them. Yeah. So that was a big target for me. We went to this tree where uh, some researchers had seen some a couple uh, weeks before we got there and we shined up into the tree. But I mean, this thing was like 300 feet tall. It was, it was an yeah. insanely tall tree. So you can see anything. I'm sure there were plenty of bows up there, but Amazon Absolutely. tree bows are different. Those guys I've seen, I've had the same situation Sean had with the uh, green tree bow with a huge Amazon tree bow which I think they're kind of cooler anyways, but maybe that's just because I've never seen a green tree boa. So I wouldn't maybe. doubt that if I saw one, I would think that was the cooler one. But uh, that was, it was huge. I mean, that thing it was probably like a six foot Amazon tree boa and it was just coiled on this tiny tree, like like a very small little fig. And it, it was just, just like, it's just trippy to see that when you haven't seen a snake all night and you walk up on it, it's, it's like so addicting. It's like the best thing in the world. That's awesome. So I know... I don't know their their historic geographical range, but have you ever found Kribos or anything like that? I think that might be a little too far south, but I found I found actually a like a probably the biggest wild snake I've ever seen in my life or caught was a Kribo. Uh, in oh. when we were at Tambopata, we were uh, staying well near Tambopata. We were staying uh, at this tiny little lodge close to the floating forest. And in the daytime, when we we're done with the anacondas, we usually have a couple hours in the uh, afternoon to go on just a little walk in the kind of terra firma habitat, very dry. We wouldn't be in like the wetlands. And mm -hmm. I found, I was walking and uh, JJ, the guy that took uh, Paul originally to the floating forest, he was with us and he just yells, he's like, snake, snake, snake. And we all just freak out and we, we don't know what he's doing. He just starts running. He like starts sprinting. <laughs> like, dude, he was going so fast. And I was like, he's not running from the snake. Like he wouldn't run from one, but why, how could he be running at a snake like full sprint? And then, so I, we just all just followed him. We just kept sprinting. And then he's just pointing and yelling. It was like chaos. And there's like me and two or three other guys behind me. 
and uh, we were all just running, sprinting, not sure what's happening. I hit my leg like super bad. I nailed my knee into this uh, thorny tree. And I didn't even care. It was just like, I was just like, I don't know what we're doing, but we're going. And eventually I saw like this bright golden yellow tail just so floating. It Dude, it was, it was like floating over this like fallen tree through these crazy leaves and foliage like faster than I've ever seen racers in America uh yeah. anything anything in my life and uh we, but it was so big uh, that was his downfall he was like probably seven or eight feet i have a picture i wish i could like pin it but uh it's on my instagram if you scroll far down enough and yep. it was an absolute monster we ended up being able to uh jj sprinted so fast he got ahead of it and he, he got a defensive and then i jumped on it and it, the nice. second I, I jumped on it, it came right back at my face, and I had to like dodge a yep. fucking strike, like straight past my face. And uh, I don't know if it would have actually bit though, because once we actually caught it, it didn't really calm down too much, but it would mock strike you, like it would. Yeah, its head. And yeah, and, and it would it would just like come right into your head, but not open its mouth and just punch you in the face with its head. Yep. But that that was like that was probably cooler than the anaconda, honestly. The creepos are like the king the king cobras you know of the western hemisphere <laughs> so they're they're just so cool so that's that's awesome i didn't i've gone through your stuff a lot and following you on instagram for a while but i had no idea you found one of those that's awesome it was insane dude probably the only thing that come comes close to it was a, a maserano we also found that was around the seven or eight foot mark uh and it was it was a monster and those of course never bite um even though they're rear fanged venomous uh, yeah. This one whipped me with its tail like so hard. I got a huge bruise on my thigh, and then he they would love to hit you with their head, but they it's like an actual defensive mechanism for them. They're not just being mock striking you. They like literally try to beat the crap out of you with their head. And then yeah, they drool. So oh, really? Weird. So weird. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then okay. yeah, they drool. It's so weird. But the craziest thing from him was or her uh, they she she barfed up a false water cobra like right oh. in front of us, which I felt kind of bad about, you know, because you never want a snake to regurgitate its meal. Yeah. But I, it was so huge. I didn't even know it had just eaten. And it was this little baby false water cobra, which is really rare down there. Those are a really crazy find. Those are probably more rare than anacondas. So that was cool. Is that like the craziest thing you found down there? Uh, I would say so. Yeah. Uh, the Maserana and the Kribo. Those are just like, those are the reasons I go down there for that just insane like you just don't know what you're gonna get any night you could walk down the, the same creek that we found that maserana for like a week straight and just see a couple blind-headed tree snakes or something and then awesome. one day you just get lucky and see a huge shiny black snake right in front of you just cruising in the water and because she was she was like halfway in the water they're super aquatic which i had no idea it was awesome that's crazy have you ever had any like kind of like close calls with anything out there like snake or otherwise or um any close calls only in costa rica uh i got nailed by a fertilance down there so i wouldn't even call it a close oh. call no that's not a close um, call <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah that was that was a dumb dumb young child mistake and it taught me a lesson that i'm really glad i learned uh that young because and in that way I, it sounds very unlucky that i got bit by it but it, i would call it a close call because uh, i wasn't actually fully envenomated and it didn't okay. get both things into me and so that's how i learned uh, you don't flip things with your hands down in nope. other countries like you do here at home even at home you know it's sketchy in a lot of situations but i was i was like 16 or 17 years old it was my first time out of the country uh, in my life well alone and uh I was on, since I went to that expeditionary school, they give you a month off to go do what you want to do as your career uh, on your, in your junior year. So I was going down to do uh, Fertilance research, which was really just a project I put together to test uh, Fertilance <laughs> defensive um, mechanisms. I was just trying to make something sound complicated so I could go herping, honestly, <laughs> because I was, I was just a kid. And, uh, the first night I was out there, it took me like three days to get to this place in the Osa Pen Peninsula and I'm walking down. Um, they had told me I could go on a night walk alone and I was like, sweet. They totally trusted me. And I put on my snake gaiters, but I didn't have uh, snake boots on, which 
I was not aware was a requirement or that you should do that or just rubber boots, which now yeah. like I will always wear rubber boots unless I'm just hanging out around a lodge or something. Uh, and so I was walking, didn't see a single snake all night. I found a bunch of came in. I was having a great time alone, just catching came in. A gladiator tree frog fell from the canopy and landed like right on my shoulder. It was it's awesome, pretty- dude. It was like one of the best nights in the jungle I've ever had until uh, the fertile land situation, but I'm walking back uh, about a quarter. I was probably like a half mile from the lodge and, uh, I'll just on the trail and I see this tiny little snake skimpering by and I followed him into the bush, lost him. I, I tried to grab him. I don't know what that was, but then from the, the area, and I was super mad that I missed the snake. So I was like, that's the only snake in the night. He was, he was booking it. And I, but I just couldn't ID it cause it was going so fast. And then, uh, I look around me and there's this perfect log next to me that was just like it was, had to have a snake even though like not many things have snakes under them in the jungle because there's so much i was like this right. thing this is just a great log so i went and uh reached my hand around it and the second i lifted my hand up as i saw it, a fertilance coiled in ambush right against the log uh my hand was coming up and i was totally like literally like almost touching this baby it was a neonate fertilance probably oh, okay. coiled it was probably that big and uh, he struck as I lifted and as I lifted and saw him I and that that pattern that everyone knows so well I uh, pulled back as fast as I could and as as I did that he struck and uh, he landed one on my index finger uh, right into the the nail thank god on one thing and then the other thing went into my cuticle of my nail so uh, it, it definitely put venom in me and it actually ended up swelling up my lymph nodes and it gave me bruising under my armpits it was really weird but no necrosis at the bite site which is really weird for, lucky for a both rocks bite man yeah i know <laughs> man it was insane so uh i i ran well i didn't run i took a picture of the the fertilance so people would believe me uh and then because i knew that they'd say you weren't bit by a fertilance and uh i walked back to the lodge trying to be uh calm as i felt like right. stinging it's kind of just like a wasp sting. It wasn't crazy mm-hmm. at all. Uh, but I knew there was venom in there. So there's blood coming out of my cuticle from the coagulate or uh, anticoagulants. And then I felt the stinging. So I was like, we definitely need to go to a hospital. And I'm like eight hours deep into the jungle. Uh, you'd have to take a bus and then you'd have to take a helicopter flight over to the uh, Golfito, which is where the main kind of uh, tourism hospital is, where they actually have really good uh, care for you. And they can actually do a... a they can do tests of your blood to see if you require antivenom. So mm-hmm. I told them they activated all the emergency procedures. We took this truck into town. By the time we got there, though, was, we really booked it. We probably got there in like four or five hours. Uh, and of course, everyone's super pissed. I'm super pissed, um, but also feeling really lucky. And we had to cut all the bracelets off my hand. It started to swell a little. And we're just expecting the worst. We're just like, this is just the beginning. We're going to get necrosis. We're going to get all this. Uh, I'm going to start feeling sick soon. But uh, none of that happened. I got to the hospital. I felt fine. And I don't think it was a dry bite. I think he just missed. Like, I just got really lucky. He just got one thing and it was in my cuticle, which isn't, you know, a big spot for blood to go into your bloodstream. So, and I I bled very profusely, which probably helped. So uh, we got in there. They gave me some antibiotics and stuff, but. Uh, it was an interesting time. I learned That's a lot from that. So yes. now, yeah, now I take I take uh, I take jungle herping a lot more seriously. I beforehand I was like, yeah, we're just in a little like jungle wonderland, and I can just prance around and flip whatever I want. These snakes love me, you know. I'm not a threat to them, and you're not. But you gotta be. You can't be stupid. And I was just young and stupid. And you know, I think he thought that my thumb was a prey item. It definitely wasn't a defensive strike. I think it was. He was in ambush and he was waiting for movement to cross his his uh, line of sight. And I was my finger was his movement. So it's nuts, man. That's crazy. But yeah, unfortunately, it's a lot of times those like sobering moments that gets us to go, okay, time to time to be smart about this for from henceforth. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and, and I think there's only so many things you can do about close calls, you know, when you're herping because you just yeah. are out there with wild animals. And since then, I've had a lot of close calls too. Uh, nowhere near that. I don't free handle. Uh, I don't pin snakes ever. I've actually never pinned a snake in my life, which I should probably learn how to do. Uh, but I just don't think it's necessary uh, for most 
things, but as far as just not realizing um, where a snake is or mm -hmm. other other things that are dangerous, like pulling over and not getting over enough when you cruise a snake on the highway and a semi almost creams you. Uh, yeah, been there. <laughs> stuff like been that. There. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I mean, I've literally, probably the other closest possible call was um, at a rattlesnake den that I visit a lot here, about 30 minutes from my house. I feel really comfortable with these rattlesnakes because I've known them since I was a kid. At each one, I can identify. Uh, it's one of my favorite spots. And there's about, there's probably a couple hundred rattlesnakes in this small area. It's protected. It's a state park. So uh, no cool. touchy and no one really knows about it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a closed off section that no one really has access to unless they, it's like me or a couple other people that the, the park people trust. Uh, but I put it, I went down to take a picture of one that I saw in a crevice, which is pretty typical. They like love, love to hide in cracks down there. And yeah. uh, I didn't realize there was another one coiled uh under the crevice in a little bush it was a big viridis big prairie rattlesnake oh, wow. and i was filming it's all it's on instagram uh if you go down probably like two years back uh and so i posted it as awareness because it was just mind-blowing i didn't realize that the snake was there until i watched the video and went to go post it just to post <laughs> a rattlesnake video and i was like holy shit i put my knee on a rattlesnake that was coiled i bent down and literally my knee like cushioned onto a rattlesnake in ambush and oh my God. it didn't do anything it didn't rattle it didn't let me know it was there it never even like it never moved it was insane and it literally was coiled and i put my knee on it that's insane <laughs> yeah Holy so i think it like it's just happens like you get relaxed uh with what you're doing you trust yourself too much and then nature uh checks you very well yep. so that's crazy that's that's nuts man so like like what are some of your like where, where are some of like your favorite herping places both net both internationally and here um in state and out of state uh so in state uh it's gotta be it's gotta be otero you know yeah any color would probably say that's just so fun because there's not much new there for me uh other than a blind snake which would be great but there's just herp density. It's like going to Kansas. Like I could go uh, flip 30 ground snakes in a day, some ring necks. I could cruise a coach whip, a few coach whips. They're bright red down there or they're, mm. they're like dark caramel colored, both of which is awesome. Uh, speckled Kings, you can flip. I mean, you could easily have like a 10 or 12 species day there in like early or late spring. And then uh, out of state, but in the States, I would have to say, Arizona you just you just can't beat it you know it's 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 become kind of mainstream for people like there was a huge flood of people that were coming down there this yeah. year that's kind of why I didn't go during peak season uh, a lot of new herpers a lot of social media herpers that are going down there just to try to get pictures of the cool animals to post which is kind of a pain but uh, a lot of other genuine people that actually live down there and go down and do really cool stuff in the strange ranges that no one really even knows about to this day uh at the animals that are in there so i love going down there and targeting weird things like we went to a really rare well kind of hard location for uh, green rats this year and we ended up getting one which was sweet um i love going for montanes up in the wachukas that's a sweet range which is super common for people to go uh but like they're the colors of the clobs and the willer dye there are just yeah. insane they're just like peachy i just love it so They're you just really can't really beat that. And I, I kind of appreciate it more maybe because I don't live there and I never have. So it's always been like uh, a dream to me. Like when I first went down there in 2017, I think we had our, I probably still had the best year I've ever had down there because it was, that was probably the last big monsoon season was 2017, I think. And oh, wow. uh, we got like three, three or four, four, including one DOR uh, Sonoran coral snakes. And then I, we got oh, wow. a wire snake. We got um, green rats. We ended up getting plenty of blacktail. I went down there this year and I only got like no blacktails actually. Oh, we got the we got a clob or two. We got a bunch of atrox. I ended up getting a speckled rattlesnake finally because I targeted them. I've never really target speckleds, uh, mm -hmm. but finally did. So it's fun. I really want to spend a lot more time down there though. That's yeah. cool. I'm actually making it down there and it's in January, so I'm not going to really see anything, but have you, have you been down there like in the, 
the high season? No, not for not for herping. Unfortunately, it's most of my stuff is uh, either uh, a lot of Western Slope stuff or Otero. Oh, Otero. this year was pretty dry for me, but yeah, yeah, really dry, man. It's just, I mean, caught, like I'm amazed at some of the things that people did find in Arizona this year. They just went so hard that they had to find something, but I mean, it was it should have been much better than it was. So yeah. same with California. I was down there a lot this year just because tickets from Colorado to Cali are like 60 bucks because of coronavirus. And uh, I went down there like when Corona first hit and no one like was wearing masks or anything. No, nothing was shut down, but tickets were really cheap. So I got down there with some friends and we like killed it really surprisingly because the rain, there wasn't much rain, but uh, we ended up getting a ton of snakes. I mean, that was probably my highest snake uh, trip. I think we got like 40 or 50 snakes in one day and a bunch of lifers for me. So I've never really spent the time. I used to live in San Diego before uh, Colorado, but I never really herped it very well. I just didn't know much. I didn't have a car. I was a kid. So right. we went down there and we killed it. And then hopefully going to get down there uh, this winter for some little turds, go flip some buzzy bows, rubber bows and stuff. That'd be fun. I love those guys. It's so weird that those exist out here, that those exist at all. Like you can say boas are in the States. I just love it. Yeah. It was, so. man, it'd be so cool to see. Have you, have you found a lot of like locale specific of uh rosy bows anywhere or? Uh, this year I got my first one ever. So uh, I don't know many locales. I really want to dive into that, especially in Arizona too, for desert right. rosies. I've tried those. And I always failed. I know like the average probably for people would be like four or five trips to go find those before wow. the sea one. But uh, down in Cali, I went to try it just for the coastal rosies, which are mm-hmm. kind of more drab, but they're sweet. And I got my first one, first rock I flipped. Boom. It was like right there, huge fat one with a stub tail. And that was nice. awesome. But I've tried so hard for them before and I had never found one. I flipped a bunch of places around San Diego uh, with my friend, Nate. Uh, it was Jeff Nordland, a bunch of people that really know their stuff. And they oh, wow. these Jeff, bows Jeff took you out with him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've been out a few times with him. He's He actually uh, got me my first ever uh, Sidewinder out in Anza Borrego. And it was oh, in wow. November. We cruised it in like 50 degrees. We, just, we I was just down there visiting my sister and it wasn't a great time. But he was like, hey, let's just go out, see what we see. And we ended up getting that. And then uh, we ended up... I think that was the only snake of the night actually we got like one dr glossy but that was amazing for me so Crazy. but uh the bows the bows this year we ended up it was just weird it's that's how herping is like you don't see something for years and then i ended up flipping the first rock and there was one under there and then like five minutes later someone else found one uh then i found one with my friend jj uh jj herps on if you know him Jaden klein mm-hmm. um he's really he really knows his stuff too He's, he's an amazing photographer. So uh, we were just walking after photographing these two. And then we found one literally just crossing a trail right in front of us at like 11 a.m. Beautiful boa. And then I found another one later that day at like 12 uh, between these rock crevices that I grabbed, but I couldn't get a good hold of him. So I had to let him go. And then uh, I was walking around that same crevice like an hour later. And I found a huge one coming out of a burrow. He was like halfway out of his burrow. And I managed to ease him out. And that was probably the biggest We ended up with like five boas, a bunch of ruber, uh, red diamonds, and it was it was insane. A bunch of gophers, of course, some striped racers we missed. But that's crazy. Love it. That's nuts. That's awesome. Do you yeah. like where so do you have any uh do you have any plans? So I know you said hopefully this next year is gonna be big. Do you have stuff kind of lined up after um after peru in january uh yeah so uh one of the other places i filmed for is jungle diaries they're an ecotourism company Uh, i love filming for those too that's honestly if i could choose anyone to do videos for it would be ecotourism companies because they do so much good for the environment Mm -hmm. and they give back so much especially daniel and priscilla uh two partners who own this company and uh, I did some work for their pet pet stores uh, reptile factory down in LA too and uh, so we're going to Ecuador in March and I think I'm I don't think I'm going to film for them during that we're just going to go on a fun trip to uh, go on an ayahuasca retreat and then we're also going to herb it 
we're gonna like backpack in a ways, go in a few days deep into the jungle, really deep, awesome. and uh, see what we see. But I'm super stoked for that. It's like with a bunch of my biggest like kind of biologist heroes that have done some of the best research I've ever yeah. read. Like uh, awesome. um, Jaime uh, DJ Medeiros, if you know of him. He's like an familiar. amazing photographer for photo wildlife tours. Um, they kind of work together, to my understanding. But uh, all that, it's gonna, they're all going to be there. It's going to be a fun time. Then I don't know. I really want to film for them for as long as I can. It helps them and anywhere else that's like that. So I think we have pretty big plans. Uh, we want to go to Morocco later this year, Spain, and wow. then somewhere else. I don't even remember. But it's all it's all in the air until it happens. Even Peru, I'm I'm not like I'm really crossing my fingers because I'm I just don't ever try to get too excited that I'm going anywhere these days. Just with COVID, yeah. world climate, I really don't know what the next day is going to bring. So hopefully I get down there. Hopefully I get down to Ecuador. But last year we were supposed to go to Ecuador too, and that fell through because that was right when COVID hit. It didn't happen. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, that's still that's. That's actually, that's absolutely amazing. It's really cool. Are, are you just parked on the side of the road? Yeah. Is that what all that is? Or is... Yeah, man, I am. It's like, it's getting a little busier. Yeah. Uh, I live in, I live like just outside of Denver. So okay. there's a ton of people here. We have like 10 million people. It's insane. Yeah. It's Denver's getting big. Yeah. It's like, it's like the new California, basically. Yeah. It's terrible. So I got to move. This is definitely my last year in Colorado. I love the state. I love being able to snowboard and the herping's great in the summer, but the winters mm-hmm. are just horrible and the people kind of suck sometimes. So. Right. What, thinking out to maybe like Arizona or Utah maybe? Yeah, or I, I want to be in Cali for the habitat and the snakes, but I yeah. don't want to be in Cali for the taxes and the laws <laughs> and yeah, a lot of that. the population. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, I don't know. Somewhere south, though, it definitely won't be anywhere north because I can't mm-hmm. do that. <laughs> right. So I don't Have know. We'll done... see. There's a lot up in the air right now. Yeah. Have you ever done any herping mm-hmm. kind of like in the southeast of the of the states? Like in Florida? I haven't. Or... That's like a really – yeah, that's totally uncharted for me. I know oh, wow. so many great people out there that do so much stuff and it like i mean we both do like the people kill it out there and there's so much so many crazy snakes like ferrancia is one of my dream species to go see in the wild i've never made it over there ever nowhere out there i've been out to uh maine and the whole northeast but i didn't herp it i was just out there in the winter which is maybe why i'm not very fond of it because it was all dead and stuff yeah i couldn't even find a salamander or anything but i also don't know how to hurt that that would be a huge learning curve for me so i'm excited to go try it but that sounds absolutely cool like i just the there's so many different like not even microclimates because even that is insane but like just the so many different areas that you can find all the different herb tiles if that's a, a term you want to use it's just crazy like the Pacific Northwest where we're still flipping rosy boas, like with snow on the ground or not rosy boas, sorry, rubber boas. And then, you know, mm-hmm. the Northeast is just like a whole other difference where like, I know there's some people that do like the, not the cane. Well, they're the cane breaks, but the, what's what are, I'm totally brain farting. What are the cane breaks called as you go further North? Uh, timber, timbers. Timbers. Timber. Yeah. That they just throw on gators and they just go through and literally just kind of like, shuffle through knee waist high ferns under you know like that conifer forest and they just find just timbers on a walk like that's crazy to me that is crazy i've literally never been in that kind of habitat or like apalachicola area i've never been yeah. seen that i've never seen any kind of habitat east of in in the right season east of colorado or kansas yeah. at least and uh, i really want to check it out yeah i was in oklahoma uh shooting a video for some hunting company uh back in september and got one kind of east coast area uh species which was a red belly snake <laughs> just That's a tiny cool, though. Guy. but it yeah. was awesome i was i like, looked down and i was like dude yes I, I got one little east snake and then um they were they told me the place was loaded with copperheads and all these crazy snakes 
of course they chopped the heads off of them and i was like guys mm. i'll just come out here and remove all of your snakes for you but it's not hard <laughs> um, yeah they, and they all saw one we like split up on into like three different groups and I, we had a cameraman with each group they're hunting hogs which are invasive down there uh mm. just controlling them and uh people can like pay to come do that. So we're filming a promo video for him. So I was just hiking all day with this group of people. And of course I totally expected it. Cause it's just how it happens. Uh, I didn't see any snakes with them except the red belly. And then they all saw copperheads. Each person saw a copperhead. Each person saw an Eastern hognose snake. And then one girl saw a rough green snake. And they all took oh. pictures of them and they were like, Oh, look at these crazy, scary snakes we found. It was like, God damn dude. I, I just would have killed to see a single one of those. Copperhead right. would be amazing for me. They're like, I know they're like trash snakes to a lot of people out there, but if they were rare, I swear they would be like the holy grail of the country because they're so Copperhead gorgeous. So cool. Like, that's that was that, like, there's there's just so much about copperheads that people don't like fully appreciate. Like, they were one of the first species to give parthenogenic, sexually dimorphic offspring. Like a female produced really? male and female viable offspring. Yeah. A copperhead, which is insane. So I didn't know that. Jeez. Mm-hmm. I think it yeah, was same with top nose. Like yeah, those, those are so cool. It's like an American cantil. So Yeah, exactly. But that's still really cool. So um I mean that's that's really about it. Uh, that I that I had for you. Did you have any like just kind of cool, like fun little things to kind of like just fun little stories, even just like here in Colorado or. Uh, man, what's the craziest thing we've done out here? Um, you know, honestly, my favorite thing out here in Colorado to do, or the, just the craziest thing that I just love is uh, the dens, the high density of really weird prairie rattlesnake dens that we have. So, yeah. um, that's where I, I would really like just to Colorado's horn uh, by saying that we have the weirdest habitat with the weirdest colors of prairie rattlesnakes. And it's totally worth coming out and looking for. Uh, there's, you know, there's the place I go that's in the state park, but which is nice, but they're, they're riddled in, across the entire front range. You can walk out into like this weird pine granite habitat where there's big boulders everywhere and pine trees. And there's usually snow around unless you're in the summer. Um, and you'll find literally piles of prairie rattlesnakes. So I love that. That's what I love about the entire West is like, you can just go and find Oregonus. You can find, uh, Arizona blacks just lumped together, enjoying their day, just every spring, every fall, like clockwork. And you can see so many crazy behaviors from them. So, I mean, I've seen, I've seen combating snakes, not prairie rattlesnakes, unfortunately yet. That's my big goal for this year. But uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, them giving birth, I've, I haven't w- witnessed them giving birth, but I've seen them like hours after and then hours before. I really want to target that to actually see it happen. But if you come out here, your chances of seeing actual snake behavior, if you can stay hands off with a good zoom lens and just watch, it's amazing. So right. I love that. That's probably why I haven't, Obviously, you can do that in the east, you know, timber rattlesnakes all den up and stuff and copperheads. But out here, it just feels like there's something different about just being in this atmosphere. And they're all really calm. They don't even care that you're there usually. And I, I just love that. But I don't know. Yeah. That's awesome. Are you just kind of going a little stir crazy right now? Because you can't do a whole lot right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very it's it's yeah. honestly such a pain i mean i every winter i end up leaving that's probably even why i end up getting addicted to travel because i lived in colorado yeah. if i lived somewhere great for her being i probably would never really leave except for occasionally but here i try to be gone for as many weeks out of the winter as i can oh wow and uh just... it's just because it's it's freezing cold there's nothing that you can see out here you can't find turtles you can't really even go fishing because everything's frozen over. There's not much outdoor besides uh, snowshoeing and snowboarding, which is great. And I've, I've, I've improved my astrophotography a lot because the skies are really clear up here in the mountains, but I just love going out and finding snakes. So yep. you gotta, I gotta find a way to go do that more out of this state, but yeah. That's awesome. 
Cool. Well, uh, I think I think that's just about it. Um, I mean, do you keep any of your own? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I keep uh, one reticulated python. Uh, she's she's a mochino, uh, so she's a full uh, mainland. She's gonna get huge. She's about a year and nope. a half now. Yeah, she's she's already surpassed my height. She's like six two right now. It's insane. Oh yeah, no, they yeah those those things they'll go. I mean, they'll outgrow three cages in two years. It's yeah, so fast. She's on her third. <laughs> it's insane. And I don't even power feed her or anything. I'm feeding her once a week a uh, small rat. And she yeah, just that's, takes it. She loves it. Yeah, that's it. all you need to do. Yeah. That's a, so I, yeah. I used to keep a lot. I used to keep like Western hogs, um, captive bred. And then I used mm -hmm. to keep uh, a lot of bull snakes. I loved them. Like some of the native animals, but captive bred kind of cool morphs. I used to keep a lot of boa constrictors. Uh, stuff like that but I just don't have the time and I'm not home enough even though they're super you know low yep. maintenance I just want one great thing that's super intelligent yeah yeah you still you know gotta do a lot to take care of them when you have a good amount so but that's awesome like yeah it's retics it's just a whole other it's a whole other animal really like a, it's mm -hmm. even keeping other large snakes just retics they're just they're different even than what they were like five six years ago like they're yeah like their personalities, their temperaments, everything is just kind of probably the reason why people, some people think that snakes can be, you know, uh, domesticated, but mm -hmm. yeah, probably. Yeah. I just love their, they, they literally get to know you and I've never kept a snake that really is so smart and intuitive and always active. And it really gets to know you and you can like literally train it to know when feeding time is to know its territory. She even has a special spot that she goes and takes her poops. It's great. Yep. Well, let's be, be hopeful that she sticks with that because a 15 foot snake, that's a lot of poop. I bet dude. I'm not it's looking forward weird. to that. <laughs> yeah. That, that's going to be, it's going to be a dump truck. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's great. Cause you're like, it only eats once a month, but that's a big poop though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude, big poop. So yeah, cool. Well, um, thanks for you know giving me the time to do this and you know give a chance to shed a little bit of light on you know more than just keeping reptiles. Like it gives people a real chance to like appreciate nature and the species themselves, like in their natural habitats, which then maybe that can reflect in keeping too, because you know it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all still keep them in a box, regardless of what kind of box it is in our basements. But, you know, if you go out and appreciate it and see like, oh, wow, I keep, you know, I have a bull snake, but Colorado bull snakes, you can find them in all these different habitats and ranges. And can I, how can I reflect that and things like that? So, um, yeah, if anybody wanted to, to follow you, how could they get a hold of you or, you know, kind of uh, keep up with it? Yeah, I would say uh, I'm mainly on Instagram, just life.of.ian or just Ian Breland. You can look it up. Um, right. I, that's mainly where I stay active. Facebook, I'm on a bit. I try to uh, make YouTube videos every once in a while, but I'm already like filming so much for my job that I just hate filming myself. So it, it doesn't happen that often. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just Instagram. That'd be great. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ian. I really appreciate it. And hopefully, you know, Maybe I can uh, get back with you for another video further uh, after see how this year went for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. I'd love to hear more about your captive keeping, too. I checked out your YouTube a bit. That's pretty crazy. So yep. all the stuff you took care <laughs> At some point, we'll have to maybe, like, meet up if, for, like, a weekend or something. I can give you, a, give you a tour, and we can go out and check out, maybe find a speckled rattlesnake. That's my – Yeah, dude. That's a lifer for me here, so – Oh yeah. I mean, dude, they're a dime a dozen when you go to the right spot. So yeah, they're awesome. Love those Sweet. guys. All right. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed this podcast. If you have any questions, you know, uh, hit up me in there. If you have any questions for me about, you know, my, my captive stuff or any questions you have for me, you know where to hit me up. Jay-Z's reptiles, gmail.com, all of that fun jazz. And we will check you next time.